All right. Well, we're going to wait another few minutes, see if any more students show up. Sarah Elwood, are you out there? I am. Do you know how many more students we're expecting? Um, uh, for the students who have accepted the invite, I think there's yeah. just a few more we're waiting on. Okay, we'll wait a few minutes. Yeah. That'll be good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Scott, Jamil's son is a student at Mercersburg now. Oh, very good. Very good. What year, Jamil? Uh, he's class of 24, so freshman, first year. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Whereabouts are you, Scott? I'm in Ridgefield, Connecticut. So oh, okay. I'm right on the line um, between New York and Connecticut. Yep. Know where it is. I had a girlfriend from college that lived there. That's the only reason why I knew where it was, but I never went. Right. I just knew she was from there. <laughs> right, right. Small town. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it's a small town. Sweet town, small sweet town. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's fun. Lots. It's a uh, parent oriented and kids oriented community. Um, yeah. You know, which is good you know, with the kids coming up and that type of thing, not as diverse as we probably would like. Um, but we have Danbury right next to us, which is, which, you know, yeah. can, it, it works, so it's good. And Scott, Ali Hawk is a colleague of mine who teaches Spanish here at Mercy. Very good. I think I'm gonna, I'm actually uh, debating on, not debating, but I'm gonna try to relearn Spanish again and get much better than I was from from high school so, so I think it'll help me and I think it just keeps my mind active too okay listen it's five after two I think we're going to go ahead and get started and then sorry right. let people bleed in so we have a couple more students coming. yeah and, yeah uh, so so student count we just have Griffin right I so think far, right yes okay Yep. That's all right, Griffin. You're getting special attention. Yes, you today. are. <laughs> you yep. are going to get special attention, and that's that's good. Um, so and we'll see who else shows up. Okay, my yep. job is to introduce the speaker, Scott Kemp, who is a 1984 graduate of Mercersburg Academy. And after leaving Mercersburg, he went to University of Pennsylvania and got a degree in economics from the Wharton School of Business. And after that, he has been employed in the business world for uh, most of his career, he just retired and is ready to move into nonprofits. Some of the things he did, he worked for PepsiCo as director of selling and delivery. He switched over to Coca-Cola, where he did things like being director of small store sales, director of retail sales, and a large store manager. Right? He's done all those things. But most important to me is that Scott and I actually lived together in the dorm way back in 1983-84. I knew him really well because I coached him in football. And we ran into each other a whole lot doing social activities and things like that. In fact, he still has in his yearbook a picture of me with my daughter, Molly, that he's going to show you in a minute, I think. So you can imagine how delighted I was when I saw that I was going to be moderating a talk by Scott Kemp, who is a great guy and a wonderful grad. And we are very glad and happy to have him here. And it's a real honor and a pleasure for me to introduce Scott Kemp. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so when I... When I heard that Mr. Malone was going to be the uh, the um, teacher present with this, I thought the first thing I thought was they're trying to keep me under wraps and he'll take care of me if I get out of line. But then I went back to my yearbook and I, I the yearbooks, I, I was there three years and I that that top picture is uh, Mr. Malone and Molly, his daughter. Who's now, know, what are you third. laughing at? <laughs> <laughs> who is like 37 love it man it's great 37 you know, I've, or never, I've never seen you i never need i've never seen you look so young yeah <laughs> look at that. well the other look thing that that I was thinking, the other the other thing i was thinking too is i know mr malone was in the um was a teacher advisor for the black student union we didn't have that in 84 but i think the reason they asked him is because he had that fro right so he had a nice fro <laughs> going <laughs> that was it <laughs> so then the now, down on the bottom, uh, the bottom right picture is, this is when I was my first year at Mercersburg. I was a sophomore or lower midler, I guess. 
we were terrible. Um, mm. I mean, absolutely right. terrible. Like those first two years, we won like one or two games and we played all the hard teams. I mean, it wasn't like, and these teams that we played, they were, we had, I don't know, I'm making up a number. Say we had a hundred boys um, at Mercersburg, they had 300. So it was the Hill School, Shady Side, it was St. Albans, it was Landon, Episcopal. Yep. And and I'm 32 down on the bottom. You can see Mr. Malone top left, uh, Mr. Reisner right below him. Um, and I'll never forget, we were playing Episcopal, and we were playing Episcopal at our at at Mercersburg. And Mr. Malone walks in, and this is before hype music and all that type of stuff, right? I, I don't think we started doing that until my senior year, but Mr. Malone came in and he said, listen, these guys are, you know, the same as us. They put their pants on one, one leg at a time, right? And we should be able to play with them. And I think it was Pat Flanagan, who's next to him in this picture. Yeah, he, he is in up. that picture. He's right yep, in front he, of me. He looked up and he said, yeah, but Mr. Malone, their legs are a lot bigger than our legs are. And, and, and the whole room just burst out. Right. So it, those were fun times. The good thing is my, um, my senior year, I think we were like three, four and one. And we, we got, we were better. Um, but that was a big achievement, especially playing those teams that we played against. And, um, and so I'll tell you some stories about that. Um, the, thing that I would like to do as much as we can make this as interactive as we, as we can would appreciate it. And that's everyone. Um, it'll, it'll just make it easier. I'm not a teacher. Um, I'm not an expert um, in black history. I can only tell you my own experience. Right. And I'm going to come to you, frankly, today from my heart. Um, and obviously this is a safe environment and, it, and frankly, I can learn, you know, from you and I'm sure you can learn some from me. Um, and then we'll kind of go from there. So that's it on the picture. Then the agenda. I think we mislabeled the um, the meeting and it said my memories and my thought because I only have like one or two thoughts. So it was limited, but I'll probably share a little bit more today. But today I'll go over my experience, um, how to be an ally, unsung heroes. Um, I hope you'll I really hope you like because a lot of times when we go through you hear Black History, we're in Black History Month right now. A lot of times, Black History Month turns into Martin Luther King, turns into athletes, and that's about it a lot of times. A couple couple other ones, but I want to give you some that some are close to me, frankly. Um, some I'm related are related to, which is pretty cool. And some have connections to Mercersburg, too. Um, we'll talk about bias and then i'll just just finally just some advice and closing after that so um and i'm going to open this up to the group and i'm not going to give you the answer but i want to know from you what you think is an ally and when i say this an ally an ally for african americans um and that could either be people or organizations kind of how do you view an ally Go ahead, Mr. Malone. You're going to have to kick one off. Okay. All right. Uh, an ally is someone who uh, understands the experience of Blacks in America and knows that uh, they can do things to help them have a better experience and to uh, make sure that they don't suffer some of the inequities that they have traditionally suffered from. So it's someone who takes an active role in helping to make America a better place for African Americans. Okay. Griffin, good. You can take it off mute. And you're safe here too. Um, I was going to say an ally is someone who um, tries to like actively help like a certain cause. Um, whether it's like uh, racial equality or like um, who um, I think an ally is like attending like um, LGBTQ like plus conferences or something like that can be like an ally as well. Yep. Good. Good. Okay. So let's do this. I'm going to start. Oh, go ahead, Sarah. Or Allie, you're, you're, you're live yeah. right now first. Go ahead. Um, I was going to add maybe someone who doesn't really understand, but it seeks to understand and learn as well. That's good. Yep. Very good. Sarah? 
Um, I just to add to that, um, if it hasn't already been said, it's kind of like a friend as well. Someone who's there actively supporting and um, being there. Okay, good. Jamil, do you want to go or you want to hold? Oh. You're on mute. There we go. There you go. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's been said, but I think uh, it's it's sort of a modern, modern sort of uh, a modernized version of the term partner um, in terms of it's just not what I can do for you and what you can do for me, but more that there's a um, there's a difference in terms of power. Um, that person that is the ally has a, a certain power that the other group does not have, and they can use that power to help really the other group that they're utilizing it for in terms of the help to really help bring them into the fray um, better uh, and more. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thanks, Jamil. Okay. So here's, here's my thing for you guys is as I, I'm going to go through my experience next and through my experience from growing up to where I am right now, I, I've had allies. I've had allies that have been people and I've had ally organizations. So what I would ask you to do when I start to talk about one of them, just interrupt me and just say, Scott, that's one of your allies, right? You know, so let's, let's just, so as you, as I go through, just think about it. Um, and, and I'll tell you and remind me when I hit an ally, either a person or an organization, um, that kind of helped me out throughout the, throughout my years. So, um, so I'm going to start with where I grew up and all that type of stuff. I would tell you, I'm going to drop in some racist incidents, discrimination incidents, and all that type of stuff. All I'm going to tell you is, yeah, some things have changed now. Yeah, some things are still the same. Um, and it's not all inclusive, but are, there, there are ones in here that I think are important, right? Um and so I grew up in Western Pennsylvania. I was about 20 minutes outside of Pittsburgh. Um, my father um, worked in the steel mill at night, had a landscaping business, had a farm. He worked, he only stepped about four hours a day. Um, my mother went to work um, in the school system and she, um, she went to work as soon as I went into school. Um, now, one of the things that's, a, that's interesting when I'm not gonna go into it today, but my mother was very, very light skinned, right? If you saw her, um, you might say she might be Allie's mom. And so, so that also presented um, interesting things. And it actually, some of that plays on to me too, right? So, um, you know, she was the first majorette um, black majorette in her high school, which was pretty big. Um, and frankly, she caught it kind of from both sides too, right? So there were interesting things going on. A lot of times, frankly, too, <laughs> what would happen was people would think my mom was white and my dad was black, right? And, and look, and I can even remember a trip to Dayton, Ohio to see my um, sisters that were in college. And there was a guy staring at or staring at us. And I remember looking, I was probably only like five or six years old and I stuck my tongue out and my dad was like, no, please stop. You know? And, you know, cause I just didn't get it. Um, at that, at that point, um, I did really, really well academically in my school. I, um, excelled athletically. I was involved in extracurriculars, all this stuff. And, um, and, but when I look back, there were a couple of like kind of key incidents that happened to me. Um, when my dad, we were doing a landscaping job and he would put in new lawns and put in shrubs and all that stuff. And I was probably only like nine. And we, that's back in the days of yellow pages, right? So people would look in the yellow pages, which was a book, get the ad and then call you. And we, when we arrived at 
the job, the people slammed the door in our face, right? And I, I didn't get it. I didn't know what was happening. I didn't understand it. And I didn't, I didn't ask my dad either. We were just kind of quiet on after that. And years later, it kind of hit me. Um, the one that was like really in my face was I was in Little League Baseball and it, it was an away game and I'm playing in the outfield and I must have been, I don't know, eight, nine years old. Somebody it was like a teenager in the outfield yelled, that wasn't a player from the other field, starts yelling, hey, you N-word, hey, you, the derogatory term for someone back in those days that was gay, right? And I can remember like the tears just pouring down, right? And I went to the, uh, went to the bench and the coach was like, what's, what's wrong? And I told them because they didn't hear it. And, um, and it was just tough. So those were kind of two of the incidents that I could think of um, that kind of stuck out. So how did I get to Mercersburg was there was a, our dentist, Dr. Fabian, who was an alumnus of Mercersburg. I think it was class of 60. Um, he started telling my parents about Mercersburg and we took a trip up um, and so Dr. Fabian might have been a what? An ally of your parents and of you. <laughs> yes. So so we came to Mercersburg. I can remember my dad being like so shocked and proud, like looking at the school. And and they told me, they said, hey, you know what? Um, why don't, if you want, give it a shot. If you want to come back after a year, you can come back. Right. So I got there. Um, it was similar to junior high. Um, and what I, it was similar in a lot of ways. I excelled, same things academically, extracurriculars, and all that type of stuff. But I was a little bit of a fish out of water. <laughs> okay. So um, I can remember back in those days, Sergio Valente jeans were in. They were in in Western Pennsylvania and country hood. Um, when I came, in the Mercersburg, everybody kind of had Levi's and polos and all that type of stuff. And, and my, my, the, the, those jeans that I loved kind of went into the corner. Right. So I was a little different. Um, the, but I, but I, I enjoyed it, but there were kind of like growing up or in those earlier years, there were some incidents that did happen um, that, that I think about to this day. And one was my first year. So this is, coming in as a lower middler and I can remember going into um, this room and there was like five or six people and one person was describing hey here's all the races and here's the ranking of the races right so you can only imagine where African Americans were stacked um, but and I can remember jumping in this argument saying and I, I won't say I blasted them I think I did. Yeah, I did blast him on that occasion. And, and it was, uh, you know, just one of those things that you're like, Oh, gosh, I've got to go through this that uh, that really, really stinks. The other thing was, I can remember we went to Gainesville, Florida for our baseball trip. And um, the I'd never been down south. And when we got into like that Georgia line, the Confederate flags were all over, right? And it it was it was pretty scary, and um, and it, and, it, and it was tough. Um, the the other thing that happened was my junior year. I was on the second floor of Maine, um, second floor of Maine, and we used to have this club called the Ten O'clock Club. So after we had after study hall, a bunch of us would get together and we would talk and it was a, it was a mixed group. Right. Um, and we would talk in my room on the second floor door was always open. And one student came in and said, and he wasn't part of that group. I don't know why he came in, but it was always open, but he came in and there was a baseball bat and he picked up the bat and he said, you know, where did you guys get this end beater? And I proceeded to grab him. And I threw him out of the door and I threw him in. I threw him right into Mr. Burbank, one of the other teachers. And 
that was kind of the end of it. Nothing else happened for that year until the, I'm sorry, it was like a couple months later, we were having prefect interviews and I, um, and Mr. Burbank asked me the question. He said, hey, do you remember there was an incident with you and blah, blah. And he said, if that were to happen again and you were a prefect, would you do it? And I said, you know, I would do it. Um, you know, I, 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 I would do it again if I had to. So, um, and I still got the prefect from that. But I say those with, you know, Mr. Malone and I were talking about this the other yesterday. Like those type of things happen. And I never, I don't ever remember going to like a teacher or an administrator or anyone else to say, hey, this happened and get out. I internalized it a lot. And I probably shared some of that stuff with the people in the 10 o'clock club, um, you know, that kind of helped us all get through there. So, um, Scott, I have a question about that. that yep. Would you say that it was your perception then and also looking back now that you didn't really have any adult allies when you were at Mercersburg? You know, it's a good question. I think I could have gone to people, right? I know I could have gone to you, right? I know I could have gone to uh, Mr. Weinbrenner, yep. right? Was mm -hmm. was tight. I know I could have gone to Mr. Reisner. I, there, yep. there were people there that I could have, I did, and I, and why I didn't, I'm not sure, frankly, personally, if that was, I thought I could just handle it myself because a lot of times I tend to do that anyhow, right? You know, you internalize things and you don't ask for help. Um, or you felt like, hey, this person isn't able to relate, right? right? I'm not sure what it was. So, but it's a good question. I don't know why. And, I, and when I started working on this and I'm thinking, my goodness, um, you know, this is, uh, it's pretty great, you know, pretty crazy to keep all of that stuff inside. Right. Yep. Yeah. And, then, yeah. and, and there was another one. <laughs> I'll, I'll go through this one briefly, but we, Mr. Malone, I talked about this. <laughs> so we're playing St. Albans, right. Jamil, I think you heard this story if you were on that one call and we're playing Jesse Jackson Jr. Right. Who, Jesse Jackson is one of the iconic civil rights leaders. One of our knuckleheads on the football team calls him the N-word in the end zone. And um, it was just terrible, you know. And Mr. Malone was telling me, he's, he's like, he went up to him and he was basically bragging to him that he did, you know, to try to get a rally out, out of the guy and everything and get a penalty. So um, those were the, those were tough. So, um, so that, then my junior year going into my senior year i was i went into the lead program and the lead program was a uh, program for minorities and it was i went to penn um there i think they were in definitely in virginia definitely in i'm pretty sure michigan too um and basically i think it was like three three weeks that you went there you had professors that taught you um you went to companies. Um, so we went to like IBM, we went to uh, the New York Times. It was a great program. You got familiar with other people, you networked and all that type of stuff. So um, that's what got me to go to um, University of Pennsylvania. And so the lead program would have been one of what, Griffin? One of what, Griffin? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, it would have been one of those ally, we're calling them ally programs, right? right. So yeah, that's all right. Um, so I went to, so when I went to college, I was in this one program called the pre-freshman program, which would be another ally program, right? And that program, we'll talk a little bit about one of my unsung heroes that founded the PFP program. And basically it was, it wasn't just minorities. It was if you were, um, from a small school in the Midwest, um, or they felt it was to get you up to speed um, pretty quickly before school started, right? So I went to that. Um, went to the University of Pennsylvania, loved it, absolutely loved it. Um, joined a fraternity, Alpha Phi Alpha, and you know a lot of those guys today were still, we're very close. I mean, uh, we're, 
we're having zoom calls now like every couple months once a quarter and that type of stuff and and i'll show you a little picture of that um and so i really love i really love pen i can't say it you know um i can't say it anymore um i did have you know there was weird stuff there too that happened um one of the th one of the things that would happen this is before you could swipe through an automatic card or whatever to gain access to a uh, a dormitory but they would have people and they would ask you for your card right show me your student card to get into the dormitory and you would see a lot of the white kids go through and boy as soon as like five or six of us came through it was i need to see id i need to see id right and I can remember just one day it just got into me so much that I'm like, I swore and I said, I'm not showing you any ID. Come and get me. Right. And and we and we just went through. Um, there was another incident. Um, and this 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 one went national. There was a professor there, Maury Dolphman. He was a legal studies professor and he um he told us we were going over the 13th amendment and he was asking what the, now this is, this is a class of about like 50, 55 people, what the 13th amendment did and all that type of stuff. And he, and I was like in maybe the second or third from the last row and there was like seven or eight rows and no one's answering this question. And then he looks up and there's like two black people next to me that were friends. And he, uh, he said, so um, we have in this classroom, the sons and daughters of slaves. I'm sure they know what the 13th Amendment is. And he skipped over when he got to me, he skipped over me because he didn't wasn't sure if I was black. Or not. Yeah. But but uh, this thing started protests. Um, we went to talk to him. It was pretty crazy. And it made I mean, it made it, made it to The Washington Post. It was in the Philly papers. Um, but the one thing that I, one of the things that I take away from it, no one ever interviewed us, the people that were in that, were in, actually in the room, like they never did from the school paper and all that type of stuff. So, um, so that was, that was a little different. Um, then from a business, so I went. After I left there, I went into uh, went to work for Pepsi. I was in another ally organization, the Inroads organization. Um, and what Inroads does is they teach young minority um, young, min young minorities um, business skills. Um, you know, so it might be public speaking, it might be how to dress, and all that type of stuff. And then they match them with internships, which are great. So that was um, a really really good experience for me i went to pepsi after that um mr malone described most of that i'm getting a little bit tight on time so i don't want to go too much into it but you know i did jobs it was sales sales operations um ran facilities um the things that i like were always leading people right it was it was leading people it was coaching people, it was mentoring people. Um, I did like the analytics. And then I, um, the one thing that I would say is I, I've always been passionate. And I've always shown enthusiasm, right? And that's what I would preach to my people of, I don't care what you're doing, man, just show me passion, show me enthusiasm, right? Um, that's half of it right there. Um, so I do have a wife. Uh, we actually met at Penn. Um, so so I've got a daughter, a senior at Penn. So there's three of us there, uh, or three of us that went there, and she'll be working for Budweiser, uh, Anheuser Busch, um, next year. And then my youngest daughter is a sophomore, and she um, she's doing really well, really, really. She's smart, and then she's a really good soccer player. And actually, she made all state last year as a sophomore, which was um, pretty huge. Um, so fast forward to kind of what's happening, what's happened to me in like the last year. And I'll tell you, and I'll back up even more. If you go back to 2012, when Trayvon Martin 
was killed, I said to myself, I've got to do better and I have to do something. And unfortunately I didn't. And then about a year ago, we had our, I was talking about our um, uh, fraternity. Um, We had our hundredth anniversary. And in the hundredth anniversary, I came out of that and I felt so inspired to do two things. One, I said, I've got to raise my bar. And two, I've got to start helping people of color. How I do that um, could vary. Came out of that. um, I was involved in a lot of the marches up here. Um, I canvassed a lot. Um, Did canvassing here. Went to Philly. I was in North Philly doing canvassing um, for Biden. Um, the days before the election, uh, which felt great. And I was in, I was in North Philly, which, um, you know, fortunately we had a lot of people, um, vote for him. So the, I also got involved with some charities and all that type of stuff. And then like, as we were saying before, I'm looking to go into the nonprofit sector and, um, and I've got a couple of fellowships. Um, one is with a housing, um, thing. So they have housing and they also try to help um, coach people to get by their own house. Um, and then the other one is a grant funder. So they, they donate about 30 donate, they give about $30 million each year to, um, to, um, to chair or to different nonprofits. So, so that, um, is where I am today. So, um, that's pretty much it. Any questions on that before we move into um, how to be an ally? I don't think. Oh, Did you nothing. have any people you thought of particularly as allies when you started working for PepsiCo? Um, yeah, you know, and, and they vary at certain points. Um, one was one was a guy, Tony Pesolano, and he, I was an intern in Pittsburgh, right? And I was in finance at the time when I was an intern and he was in the sales and he was a tough driver. I mean, just tough, tough guy. Fast forward, like 15 years later or whatever, I had the opportunity to run um, Asbury Park, New Jersey or Ocean and Monmouth counties in Jersey. And I had an interview with Tony, right? So I walk in and I said, he's like, I remember you and we're going through and everything. And I tell you, he was, he was one, like if you looked at his crew and he always did well, we did a remarkable comeback in New Jersey where we didn't make any money to, we were making at least 50 cents a case, which was pretty big back then. Um, But his promotion and mentoring of folks was big, you know? And, and I'll tell you, and this is kind of a little off script and made me think of it, um, was, was, um, I made a mistake one time, a diversity mistake, call it that. Um, I'm I'm sure I made more than that, but, but it was a big one. So I had a, I had a, I had a lecture or a presentation and there were, I don't know, it was probably 300, 400 people and our Lipton representative, um, he had given everyone these green hats, right? And um, and we used to joke with Vinny. We used to joke with him all the time, right? So I get up on the stage and we're talking and I said, Vinny, I said, where did you get these hats? I said, they look like Castro hats. And oh my goodness, it was terrible because number one, we had a decent sized Cuban population and to just say that word just set off all holy heck. So it's like, so sometimes I have to, I, I learn kind of quickly. I got to, you know, you got to watch and just go with it. If you're going to go off script, um, you know, you got to be careful. So yeah, that was one of mine where I made a mistake. So Scott, we got about eight minutes left before we have to start wrapping up. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'll skip the, I'm going to skip the uh, how to be an ally. I think you guys hit it. I'll, I'll hit a couple of things on this is sometimes you just have to shut up and listen. And I had, this was a, uh, this was an ally that, that I know. And that's what she said. Someone told her, right. So just listen, keep in mind, sometimes folks are going to be pretty, um, when they, 
when I saw some of the images of some of the things that happened in the past year, and they happened before that too, I know, I'll be physically sick, right? I, I'll be nauseous. And so all I ask is, man, give them some space and don't, whatever you do, don't try to kind of go back and forth at that point. Let it kind of play out. Jamil, are you with me on that one? Well, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. Um, no, I'm just saying from a standpoint, if you're, if you feel the same thing when this stuff happens, um, the other thing is, um, you know, if you can help, help, but whatever you do, avoid the white savior syndrome. Um, and what I mean by that is, and, and I saw it on Instagram, it was with Drew Barrymore. Drew Barrymore was over, I can't remember which country in Africa she was in, but she was in every picture taking selfies with, you know, every kid and that type of stuff. And um, it was, it was tough. You know, it, it was, it almost set, looked like it was more self-serving and that type of stuff. So those are the kind of big things. Um, and then let's just jump. I'm going to, um, I'll go real briefly on some of these. So this is one of my cousins. Now it's a cousin by marriage, George Barber, right? George Barber was graduated from the University of Pittsburgh, um, ended up going to KDKA out there. He covered this, the, um, the marches, Selma to Montgomery, um, and all that type of stuff. And just a real, real fighter. And he also worked on discrimination at um, the city of Pittsburgh, which is highly like he went toe to toe with the, uh, he went toe to toe with the mayor, you know, the mayor, they had this meeting. The mayor said to him, basically, um, you know, I know what Negroes want is what he said. Mm. And George Barber grabbed them and said, I know what Negroes want, right? But they ended up working out pretty pretty well together. And I would tell you personally, um, George, just a fighter. And his big thing was, if you can't figure out one thing, you go to the next, right? So um, really, really big there. Um, another cousin, and this is where the Mercersburg connection comes to a little bit, but Matt Lewis, um, he won the Pulitzer Prize for photography. He worked at the... Baltimore Afro-American. Oh, by the way, George did too. Um, and then went to the Washington Post. He's got, so he won the Pulitzer, just phenomenal photographs, covered everything. And it's just a mention of, hey, these folks, the photographers of the day, the reporters of the day, we need them, right? They capture the essence of what is happening. Um, and frankly, I was, I was watching one of his um, things on PBS and I, I teared up because he was talking about like when King was giving his speech, he froze. He couldn't take the picture because he was moved. When the riots were happening in DC, the same thing happened, right? So um, pretty moving. Now his connection to Mercersburg, his nephew is Marvin Lewis, the coach for the Bengals that also, also coached Vinnie Ray who went to Mercersburg. So it was funny when I saw Vinnie Ray's um, um, YouTube thing. I sent it to Marvin and, and cause he had some nice things in there. And then this picture, it's not the greatest picture cause I did it off of a video, but that's one of the pictures that he loves the most, right. Of the, um, the two girls together, um, on the swing. So I'll give you just the ones that here's another is my uncle Charlie. Um, now this is my uncle Charlie from marriage. He was married to my aunt Jane. He's kneeling down there um, from the left on the bottom. But what one of the he was on the first Tuskegee Airmen crew, right? So it's the first he was the first class, right? Um, wow. And I can't remember all his statistics and all that. I think he had 99 missions. It was big. Fought in Korea. Um, was a captain there, and um, just you know, amazing. Came back. Made frankly, racism and was worked for the post office. Right. So you think about somebody like that and he's, and he's long gone, but um, just phenomenal. Um, and then this guy looks a little bit like me. 
this is def, this is my uncle, my dad's brother that was on the first Steeler team, and which was really cool. He was one of the first blacks in the uh, NFL and um, faced discrimination. Um, well, they went to New York. They wouldn't let them. They wouldn't let him stay in the hotel. Um, the NAACP wanted him to sue the NFL, Mr. Rooney, the Giants. He decided not to because he liked Mr. Rooney so much um, and didn't want him to get in trouble. Um, you know, people think different things about it, but, um, you know, that was that was one of the things. But he went on to coach Ralph Boston, who was a gold medalist cool. back in the yep. uh, long back in, back in the day. So and he was a coach, director and all that type of stuff. So let's see what else we have. You guys know this. And then we're up two minutes. Go, Mr. Haskins. This was one of my mentors at um, at Penn. He started all those things, the lead program. He started the pre-freshman program. He started the, I worked in the tutoring center in the old exam file, right? He started the old exam file because all the white fraternities had old exams and would have that used there for their studies. He started it. We called him, he called him the basement boys and I was part of the uh, basement boys, but he really, really dialed things up at Penn and just, you know, I, uh, he was amazing. Absolutely amazing. And <laughs> the uh, one of, when I started there my freshman year, Carl Racine, who is the attorney general of DC, that's, he was one of, he played basketball. He was down in the old exam file, kind of put his shoulder on me too, uh, or his hand on my shoulder too. So that's that's it how are we doing for time we're we're tight right we're pretty tight but we have a few minutes for questions and things yeah like that. and if there's anything yeah. else you wanted to get to i think we could probably sneak it in yeah and i would i would just say like this this is one of my favorite pictures um of we've got to all of us have got to be kind right and the people that that are doing jobs on our different situations than we are, um, man, be kind. And, and that's what this is an example of. And I think of, and I, I was, I didn't even realize that she got an award from the black student union, but I was talking to Tanya and when they were talking about, and I was telling, I was typing to Tanya, tell her, you know, Hey, we should have a, an award for Louise. Right. And she's like, we did that Scott, because, yeah. Like, that's the type of person that, you know, like, you know, for people to be kind, because I know there were people there that weren't kind, to them, right? But I, she was there for us, which was really, really cool. Um, and that's it. Yeah, that's it. Want to go questions? I like the picture of uh, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X together. Yep. Yeah. Is there, and oh, Malcolm's a little taller. He, yeah, he's a little bit. Yep. Or right, let's go uh, top right corner. Do we see an ally in that picture? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 pretty amazing. Did you have um, any cases, um, Scott, in your career at all where you were discriminated against in terms of hiring or promotion? Yeah, yeah. And I, um, I would say this, and I had that in the thing, but it's, it's um, when you get into the professional world, it's more subtle, okay? So you start to get things such as um, you, you don't get the plum assignments, you get frozen out from information you're not invited to certain things and you say to yourself well is that just from you know maybe someone doesn't like you or whatever but over time and i know jamil can, can identify with this you can pick up on cues okay so kind of that same person said to me hey when we were looking to hire young people um and when unemployment was very high, said, hey, we need to hire kids from good families, right? And I said, good families. So so, so what does that mean, right? And, and he's like, well, I, I know these people that have good families and all that. Stuff. I said, well, I said, right now, I said, unemployment's really bad. I said, why don't we try to 
get folks that really, really need it. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to, I, it's not a good idea for us to hire someone that's not even going to do this job late. Right. And so you get those things, you get things like, um, you get things. I had this happen to me like four or five times. Um, not right. I was asked this, like, I would say two or three times, what are you? Right. And the first time I just said, Hey, I'm, a, I'm American. Right. Cause I kind of felt a little weird about, you know, when someone just kind of comes out and asks you like that. And then the second time I was like, yeah, I'm American. And then finally, and I could tell the tension was already building up. Right. And that's where the relationship just went, just went down like that. Um, you know, but you know, those are, those are tough things and you, you kind of work through them. Um, but that's also the importance of networking. And when I'm saying networking, either, um, you know, with all folks, right. That you, you've got it. You've got to have those, those friends, um, as you're coming through, that'll help you out. I have a question. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's always on my mind when I hear. So, you know, especially you mentioned the, um, you know, equal rights, but now the thing, you know, we're talking equal, like equality, but then there's equity. Um, so a lot of your story, you know, talks to equality in a sense that, you know, there were things that you were able to do, go to college, get jobs, but that the equity, there was a lot you had to do to get there with your ally supporters that helped right. you. Um, right. So I'm just trying to, you know, I wrap my, my head around, you know, the differences in, in how do people, you know, what does equality look like versus what's equity and, and your take on, on the importance of both or one more than the other or how it all played out. Yeah. I, I think it's both. Right. I think you, it's, so one of the things that I was I'm halfway thinking about too, I know I talked about the nonprofits, but um, I'm also thinking about the DE and I stuff. And so I was going through and I'll get it. But so I'm like, okay, I've got to know like the definition of diversity, equity, like what is what, right? So, but I think they're, they're, they're both, you've got to get to the party, right? Let's, let's, let me get to the party first. Um, but once I get there, you know, I, I, I need some support. Right. And I think the best way to think about it is from a track meet standpoint. Um, and this goes for all, right. So, um, if some folks, like if you're going to Mercersburg right now, um, and, or if you're going compared to someone that's going to, um, you know, maybe a school, in the inner city that's not very good, the person going to Mercersburg has a head start, right? So how do we how do we get the kid that's back here to catch up? So at least we're even, right? And um and that same thing, like I talked to some of my friends, I'm like, we started going through what certain people were doing, right? And the some of the folks, and these are all African African Americans, right? Um economically some folks the folks that had parents that went to college and all that type of stuff they went to college had a jump start on the kids like me that didn't you know that i didn't have my parents going to college right so those type of things it's 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 how do we get that gap closed um and then once you're there how do we support folks right and that's what i love within my jobs was mentoring folks um and that was all lines. That was from managers to lower executives to people on the front line of like merchandisers. And and the my last job, you know, I had a very very diverse team. Um, they were Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, Polish immigrants, um, African Americans, um, and we had a great group, you know. But there were kids. I won't say kids, I call them kids. There were young people in those groups that I would identify. And I said, we've got to, we got to help move them to make them successful. And those are fun. And they'll still call me and that type of stuff, which is cool. So I love it, you know. 
Hey, Scott Jamil. Um, uh, thank you so much for, uh, for doing this. Uh, I really enjoyed just listening and taking in your story. Uh, quite a quite a family you have there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the I didn't want to brag, but I was like, man, hey man, it's not either. bragging. It's just these are facts, man. These yeah. are just facts, you know. Yeah. Um, and 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 truly impressive facts. I mean, really, I I, I probably gonna take a little bit of time to digest it because I'm like, wow, Tuskegee Airmen, like, whoa, yeah, you know, just on that kind of a level. Um, you know, I, I um. To Ali's actually, to Ali's question about equity and and, and equality, um, you know, I was thinking about that um, and looking at the picture uh, that you have up on the on the top right, and you know, equality is it, to me it's it's you know the human race and everyone being treated equally. Um, uh, but then equity is basically, it, it's like you, you have to undo what, what deficiencies existed or exist yeah. in the system in order for there to really truly be this equality sort of, you know, baseline that, that, that you know, we all sort of aspire, you know, to have. Um, I, that's just my simple general you know kind of catch-all for it i mean there's definitely a, a much more depth that we could get into it with scott you know i thought it was really interesting um your experiences at, at, at penn you know um uh just with the with the id card i mean um <laughs> i didn't have any id cards at harvard but um we i mean we had a card but it wasn't the swipey right. and and um, you know, I didn't have I didn't have any run-ins with campus, you know, security either. It was like I was I, actually these were students. Those that. were students. That's crazy. Yeah, exactly. that's absolutely that's just nuts, man. I would have been ready to throw down if uh, yeah. students try to stop me. Um, but then again, I was like, you're a pretty big guy too. So. <laughs> no, I'm I'm small. I'm small. Uh, oh man. You know, when you were at Pepsi and, and, and Coke, you know, I was wondering, you know, and you spoke a little bit about it, sort of touched on it, but like, these are, you know, these are, those are mega companies. They're huge. And, you know, um, it's like almost going to a huge university, like, you know, Arizona State or something like that. It was 50,000, yeah. you know, and so, you know, things that are happening are so under under the sort of in the dark to some extent you know um and and how you're able to kind of get your voice heard um when you're experiencing certain you know um uh uh, uh, uh you know inequalities or, or injustices you know how how did you find a way to i mean because you were there for the majority of your careers in both of them and you yeah. know how like, how did you find that? I mean, you spoke about allyship, but, you know, in the corporate space, it, it, it's this, this, the, the, the cues, you know, you talked about the cues and how yeah. to read these cues, you know, how did you know where your allies were and who you could trust and who you could confide in? Um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a great question. The Pepsi, I think was more progressive. Okay. Overall. Right. And um, there were, I would bet the diversity numbers were better there than at the red company. And, um, but how I found them, um, it's kind of like instinct. And you know how to, um, those cues that I kind of talked about, like if somebody doesn't use them or takes an interest in you, uh, one of one of the guys that from when I was an intern, um, Gary Euler, uh, was he was my manager. Um, one of the most caring people that you would ever um, ever meet, and he was one for me when I kind of first started. Unfortunately, um, he had some medical ones. He had a medical issue, and then 
ended up passing. But he, like those type of people, like the ones that uh, get you, that, that helped you. And then we had, uh, there were African-American um, leaders at that point too. Frankly, if you look, this is our 100th anniversary in that one picture. Um, there were two brothers in my fraternity that were at Pepsi when I first started, right? So I had them right away. Um, you know, they kind of helped me out too and helped guide me. Now, the more you move up, the harder things get. And the quicker people can um, make it more difficult for you. And that's in anything, black, white, whatever. But what I did notice, and I didn't catch this, I didn't catch this for years later. Um, and actually, I, it, this was like last summer, I think that I caught myself doing this. And I didn't realize I've been doing this all my life. If someone would bring up an issue that was, I would think that they might be going to like some type of racist issue or whatever, I would change the subject. Right. So I became a master of it. I never realized I was even doing it. Okay. So for instance, um, we were at a, some folks house here and they were talking about a sorority and my wife said, Oh, they were talking about some sorority that had some incidents that happened down South. Right. And it was racist stuff. And when, when my wife said it and my wife, my wife is Chinese. Um, my, my, my heart kind of tightened and I'm like, oh shit, excuse my French. <laughs> like, here it comes. You know, I don't know how this person, she may be supporting it. And, she, you know, you just never know. And, but I realized that over the years and I've tried, I've stopped it versus trying to change the subject um, and not get into that situation. I'm like, no, 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 I can't do that anymore. That's, 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 but I didn't even realize I was doing it, but it was learned behavior all these years that, that you don't even realize that I never realized I was doing, which is kind of scary, right? Thank you, Scott. I think we need to wrap things up here. Is that right, Lila? Yeah. Griffin has been a champ. Oh, um, so oh poor Griffin. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I feel like if we can wrap up the recording and then Scott, I just want to touch base with you after, but thank you so much. And Jim, I didn't know welcome. anything to close. Uh, just thank you so much for all your insights, Scott. It's really helpful for you to be able to share your experience. And I'm so glad we could record this so we can share it with other people in the future. And we, Great. we hope you'll keep coming back because we are very proud of you and uh, just delighted to have you as part of our community. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you guys. I really, really appreciate it. I'm glad we caught back up. Jamil, we probably need to touch base too. Thank you. <laughs> Griffin, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. So much. you.